on the stairwell, there's nobody here. And me being Mr. Newt Rockney of the group, you know, I used to always say, hey, the smaller the crowd, the, the bigger the rumors. Let's go. You know, like, like uh, Mickey Rooney, you know, Miss O'Leary needs an operation. Let's put on a show. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember Glenn Buxton saying, how about if we don't play and we start a rumor that we did? <laughs> but, but anyway, we did this show, and by then, people were there. You know, it wasn't packed like Bob Edson remembers, and people weren't wearing Alice makeup like he remembers. But, uh, but we did play, but we put so much anger into this show. It was like just, it was, it, we probably were, were the, uh, doing punk more than what we, we were playing yeah. our songs, but we were delivering it like punk rock. And uh, Bob Ezrin was there, you know, and so as far as we knew, you know, after the set, this kid comes up and says, you know, hey, this is great, you know, I work with Jack Richardson, you know, uh, I'm gonna get you guys a deal with Warner Brothers, which we already knew that back in Hollywood, Warner Brothers had passed on us because uh, Mo Austin and Joe Smith were heard, overheard walking out of the Whiskey A Go-Go saying, how are we gonna go back to the board of directors and tell them we wanna hire a bunch of transvestites? <laughs> you know? we're, so they already passed us. So we're like kid, you know, I'd buy you a drink, but it's illegal, even yeah. though Glenn would do anything that was illegal. <laughs> but, <laughs> but so, yeah, so that put things into motion. Now Warner Brothers said, okay, well, oh, Bob Essen goes back to Toronto Jack Richardson's, as he describes it, Jack Richardson's desk and Jack is there and he's like, guess what? I like him. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and uh, Jack Richardson said, well, if you like him, you produce him, you know? And so uh, Warner Brothers said, okay, you know, all right, well, this sounds good, you know, maybe we'll uh, hire you guys after all. We built the reputation with the chicken and everything by then, so. Warner Brothers knew that we had, you know, uh, turned some heads. So, uh, but they said, we can't sign you to a guy that's never produced anything. We need this guy with all the hits under his belt. And so they, uh, Love It to Death and Killer were signed with the agreement that Jack Richardson had to be there to oversee the production of those albums to make sure that we got a hit and got albums under budget which that's what he did. So that's, that's how that went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. So talk about, you know, the standard of, of success in the music business is a number one record. And School's Out, I guess, was number two. But still, I mean, it's right there. So kind of talk about, like, you achieve this. So how, people probably treat you different. You, you, maybe you're thinking different. But that's, the, that's kind of the bar that we set for success oh, they had a number one record or they had a top 10 record. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, overnight, all yeah. of a sudden, uh, we got better gigs. We got more gigs, you know, and even though with our uh, image, no matter where we went, we had, for every person that liked us, there were 10 that wanted to kill us in the parking lot, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was hard to actually think, oh, now we've made it, you know, because we still had this, but, you know, things got a lot easier for us. And, the, and the, the sound of Love It To Death, of course, was a whole different ball game from what we had done before that. So now, uh, even though when we walked into the studio for Love It To Death, you know, we had had two strikes on us and we thought Pretty For You was gonna set the world on fire. Zappa told us he played it for the Beatles and they liked it. We thought, we're on fire, <laughs> you know? And, and then the second album we thought came out good too, but uh, so we weren't popping any champagne walking in the studio and love it to death, but the results got us a hit. I'm 18 mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know, overnight because I'm 18 actually broke out of Canada from CKLW, which was, uh, had this powerful transmitter that covered the whole Midwest and Canada and uh, it was uh, the DJ that played it was uh, Rosalie Trombley. They called her the girl with the golden ear because she could find hits. And back then a hit could break regionally and then expand from there and become a national hit. 
Well, that's what I'm 18 did. Uh, she started playing it like crazy. And on the third day, she told me this personally years later. I, we were having giant martinis in Phoenix. <laughs> and she told me, and I asked her, I had never met her before. I said, wow, how, what made you think 18 was a hit? She said, the lyrics. She said, as soon as I heard the, the opening verse, I knew that was a hit that was going to connect with that age group, who were the record buying age group. Mm -hmm. But so she started playing it, and on the third day, she said, all the other DJs came into her and said, you can't play this band. They, they kill chickens, you know, and stuff <laughs> like that. And she said the timing was perfect because every phone was ringing with requests for I'm 18. And I said, Rosalie, that was us. <laughs> she, she said, no, no, you guys could not. She, she said it was the most requested song in the history of CKLW. And they moved it into a heavy rotation. It was every fifth song at one point. So it would be us, the Stones, Hendrix, Beatles, or whatever, us again. And, and it'd be like that. And it became a, a you know, of course, I wasn't one to uh, bathe in, you know, success. I was, I was uh, hard to believe now, but I was a very quiet, introverted artist that was an uh, observer. And all I did is think about what are we going to do next? What's the next song? What's the next stage thing? You know, so it was, uh, I was probably the last to actually realize that we had finally made it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, talk about being kind of like a creative driving force, but not being the front man. Yeah, well, that was fine with me. I was the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtain, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was fine with me. Uh, uh, I couldn't remember lyrics. I couldn't be the front man. <laughs> I, I still can't even remember lyrics to my own songs. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that was all perfectly fine with me. Uh, the whole band was like that, though. By then, I mean, you're thinking about, it's hard to put it in perspective with all the things that have happened since then. You know, it actually was pretty shocking back then, what we did. But we had to do it uh, with the sensors breathe, breathing down our necks. Otherwise, nobody would hear it. So we had to keep going up to the line and then sticking our toe across and then pushing the limit farther and then sticking our toe across and trying to make things. So, okay, we're going to do a song called Dead Babies. But it's going to be about parental neglect, you see? <laughs> so we could outrage, but then, oh, no, it's, it's actually a socially, social comment. And it's a, you guys seemed also to be able to... Uh, get publicity, not like mainstream publicity, like newspapers as opposed to like... That goes back to the Ferris Bueller days, Alice and I, on the journalism. So when we started our band, The Earwigs, the, from Cesspool, England, by the way, <laughs> we... Uh, <Yeah>. we <laughs> and we wore the wigs, get it? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and it's a bug. It's not a beetle, it's an earwig. Uh, so, uh, and our and our drummer was named Kinko instead of Ringo. So uh, so because we worked on the school newspaper, we would figure out all these ways to get our track team in a story about us and stories about us. And and Alice was the master exaggerator, and we didn't have any scruples that way. Even though we were supposed to be writing the truth and learning to be true journalists, you know. Eh. Mm -hmm. The earwigs did this, the earwigs did that, and next thing you know, uh, uh, we're showing up everywhere. So that started early on because we saw the Stones. Okay, you could be, uh, any band could be in a, uh, a music paper in any town, you know, Village Voice or the whatever, you know, each town had their own. Uh, but if you wanted to get into the main newspapers you had to do something like the stones they the stones got headlines across the country well maybe not headlines but they got publicity in regular newspapers across the country because they they took a leak on a building you know and we're thinking oh that's like jump the shark you know we got to do stuff that 
it's going to be new, newsworthy outside of the, right. the oh, music. music. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, early on, and of course, uh, uh, Joe Greenberg and Shep Gordon jumped right on board with that because uh, Shep Gordon's hero was the Colonel Tom Parker, you know, who made chickens dance yeah. because he had them on a hot plate, you know. <laughs> and so, so yeah, so this was all very, and, and you know, our management was just as uh, uh, creative as we were. None of us knew what we were doing when we met, you mm -hmm. know. We knew what we wanted to do. We had no idea how to do it. And we didn't really want to listen to anybody's advice because if we follow rules, we're going to be like somebody else. So, so if somebody told us we couldn't do, do something, it was almost like, okay, they've tossed down the gauntlet. Let's do it, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that involved, you know. And, and also, you know, my wife Cindy was was a part of this whole thing too because uh, her making these finding these new fabrics that were chrome and uh, you know and I, I mean it was blinding chrome we would play outdoor festival and and people would have to put on their sunglasses not for the sun but to be able to look at us on stage in chrome outfits and all that uh, so you know all of these things kind of helped with us getting publicity. She made clear plastic pants for us. We played in LA and we had clear plastic pants. And uh, our managers were thinking, we're going to call up the, the cops, LAPD, and get them down here because there's a band down here wearing clear plastic pants, man. And you know, it didn't work because we were right down a few blocks up the street was the classic cat and all the, the strip clubs. Yeah. Who cared if we had clear, you know, it didn't work. But, but still, Cindy did a lot of things like that that would, you know, it was actually, that had a lot to do with our stage shows, our ideas, Dead Babies or whatever, you know, the chicken or whatever had to, had to do with getting attention really, when it comes down to it. But we were having so much fun doing it. <laughs> you, you bring up the shows, and that's a really important part, too. It's, you know, you could say it's the start of shock rock, but it was really, you know, you watch it, was almost like it ended like a morality play, you know, with the, with the electrocution or something like that. It was, well, know. again, that's the, the censors breathing down our neck. Okay, well, we're going we're gonna to electrocute our singer, you know, but... Uh, Oh, that's because he has to do something bad to deserve to be electrocuted. And then, you know what? He's okay in the end. He's resurrected. You know, like uh, mm -hmm. Kurt Vonnegut Jr. is saying, the best stories, you know, start way down here. And then something gets better. They get better. They get Everything gets better. And then all of a sudden, they're on top. And then everything starts going wrong. And, and then in the end, everything's okay. You know, he says, yeah. the Bible's like that. You know, mm -hmm. like, All right. <laughs> so uh, we had that. Yes, it was definitely a morality play. And we had thought of that idea way before we started being able to afford to do it. You know, I was getting frustrated with it when we lived in uh, Detroit because I wanted, I said, let's, let's build an electric chair. Or no, let's get an electric chair. And they're like, what? turn your pockets inside out, you know, yeah, yeah. What, what do you mean get an electric chair? I said, okay, I'll build an electric chair. And so I went out to the garage and our roadie helped me. We had some two by fours, you know, and we built this thing. We had the lights blinking and, oh, we need something to go over his head. Oh, what about the, what about that tin thing on the ceiling light of the garage? Get the, get the uh, ladder, that kind of a thing. And I don't even think the paint was completely dry yet. It's still a little ta tacky. But we went in and got Alice to come out to the garage. We turned off all the lights, so we had to kind of guide him over and get him to sit down. And then we turned on these flashing lights on the, on the electric chair and told him, Alice, pretend that you're getting electrocuted. And that was the best performance he ever did. When we got on stage, he never equaled that great, you know, he really. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was a matter of being able to afford these ideas that we had had for, for years. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a point where you guys are uh, living in, um, 
a, a, a mansion in Connecticut or something, and that's kind of like the breakup of the band. Do you, mm -hmm. Can you kind of take us through that? Yeah, well, um, we lived in Detroit, and, and our management office was in New York City. And, uh, you know, everything the band did, we all voted on, and the majority won, and then we'd all, you know, do that wholeheartedly. Uh, well, I was the only one that thought it was a dumb idea to move to New York so that our phone bill would be better, because we're never home anyway. <laughs> you know? What are you talking about? We're never home. If we move there, we won't be there either. So, but, but that was the, uh, the reasoning. We moved uh, closer to New York City because we wanted to be closer to our management office. And uh, so, you know, we piled everything in trucks, including our St. Bernard Gretchen, and, and uh, we drove to uh, Connecticut, which uh, at that time there was a tax break, so we didn't live across the border in New York, and that's what made Greenwich, Connecticut in the first place. But so, uh, yeah, so we get there, and it, it's a mansion that was, uh, had something to do with uh, Warner Baxter, the, the, the star of 42nd Street, Busby Berkeley movie. And uh, I think it was his ex-wife or something lived there or whatever. Uh, but this thing was Mediterranean. It was all way beyond anything we could possibly imagine. Uh, but... Uh, you know, well, okay, so you walk in and you're looking around and you think, wow, what a high ceiling. You walk in the next room and you go, whoa, what a high ceiling. <laughs> you know, and there's paintings way up there on the ceiling. There's a, a fireplace that's big enough to park, literally, you could park a Volkswagen in it. And then at one end of this ballroom is this giant wall of window panes, but there's no glass in it. And there's a wall about this tall and a little door. And we're looking in there and there's a bunch of folding chairs and we're, and we're like, what, what is this? I don't get it. And then this guy, just, uh, I'm not just, uh, Frederico Galesi, the owner, the owner of the place, comes bopping in with his all dressed really nice and very, you know, uh, bachelor, you know, uh, likable, I guess. And he's got his Chinese cook with him because he said he, his Chinese cook is always with him because Chinese food is not good after it gets cold. So do you guys want Chinese? We're like, well, I don't know. We're wondering about, said, oh, the room, the room. The reason it doesn't have any glass is because the orchestra goes in there and they all sit down so they can't see the guest, you know, like mafia stuff. And the music comes up through the windows. And so the people can hear the orchestra without, without worrying that. about somebody seeing things <laughs> going on that they don't want. So, okay, anyway, we're, we all live there. I mean, it's a mansion until you get 50 people in there, living there, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> all of a sudden, it's, uh, it becomes tough. Cindy uh, would do the dishes, and then, you know, five seconds later, every dish in the house would be dirty again. And it'd be because there'd be a bunch of people in our house that nobody knew, but you couldn't establish that until you waited until Glenn woke up at 3 in the afternoon or asked everybody, did you invite? No, we don't know. We don't know them. Okay, well, all the food's gone again, you know, kind of a thing. So, yeah, it's a mansion. Yeah, yeah. But it was uh, full of people. But we had our uh, rehearsal room in this beautiful room and all these amplifiers we would bring in. And, you know, and we had some powerful lamps then. Uh, more than this old mansion was wired to handle because uh, Cindy woke up one night and the fuse box was red hot. Things were melting in there. Uh, but we, we wrote uh, the Billion Dollar Babies album there, uh, we wrote most of Schools Out there, and even though we recorded Schools Out in New York City at the record plant, uh, Billion Dollar Baby. So we first come to, uh, to New York City, 
now all of a sudden, do, 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 school's out. You know, hey, we're kids, we're out of school now. And all of a sudden, here these guys from the middle of the desert in Arizona think we're West Side Story, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the fantasy. That, so, so that our environment influenced us. You know, British for you was glitzy because we lived in Hollywood, you know. So uh, Love It to Death got that edge, you know, Mother City. Uh, but uh, so now we're living in this mansion. So now we're the billion dollar babies. So all of these things had a lot to do with uh, our writing and our whole concept and our uh, what we wore on stage. So Cindy made these uh, white satin outfits for the Billion Dollar Babies album, you know, and all of a sudden now we're not these scruffy, tough Detroit street guys anymore. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the mansion had a lot to do with that. Uh, and the, 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 band actually, the band breaks up at this point? Is Alice leave well, at one point? Is, is that how I understand that? Well, uh, you know, with success comes excessive behavior. You know, all of a sudden uh everybody in the entire world wants to buy you a drink you know and and uh glenn was the one that was the abuser who uh suddenly he he couldn't function on a uh, reliable schedule you know th we would get up at 10 o'clock and start rehearsing and and glenn would show up at three and basically want us to show him what we had done so that he could join in mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, he would play great one night and the next night he would be too drunk but also Alice would be too drunk to, to, sing, to remember the lyrics. He'd crawl around the stage but with the Alice Cooper character that was endearing to the character. It worked for him. But meanwhile, the hammer's coming down on Glenn while Alice is do it, getting away with the same thing. So there were frictions like that. There, and, uh, and because when we went in the studio, Bob Ezrin had learned well from Jack Richardson not to waste a minute when you're on the studio clock. And you know, so Glenn would come in and he'd nail a guitar break. He might come in the next day and you'd spend an hour until some somebody had to go in and tell him that he had to pack it in because he wasn't going to be able to get what we needed. So, uh, and Bob Ezrin didn't want to have anything to do with that. He'd rather just bring somebody else in and, and get it done rather than wait for a good day for Glenn. And so those kind of uh, things built up. Glenn, Glenn's personality was uh, always against authority of any kind no rules don't tell me any rules i'm not going to give you a birthday card on your birthday because that's what they say i should do i'll i'll buy you something on any other day but i'm not going to follow any rules he'd love to talk to people on the street or anybody be the friendliest guy in the world but you better not tell him how to do something and now all of a sudden where when Bob Essen first entered the picture with us, it was still us against the world. And, uh, you know, we were the rule breakers and everything. But then when Bob Essen started becoming the authority, then that didn't work with Glenn. You know, you could, if you wanted Glenn to play something, you would say, okay, Glenn, play angry. Or Glenn, you're insane. Play that. Not, Glenn, you uh, play a major scale that ends on a, you know, he knew what that meant and he could do it, but that was that sounded like a rule, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to do it. So there was some of that too, but that's what made Glenn such a, an amazing guitar player, right. because he didn't play those scales. He, my favorite thing he said concerning that was, uh, never let the correct notes get in your way. <laughs> which really meant play from your heart, play by feel. Mm -hmm. That's the very first thing he ever told me way back in Phoenix, Arizona, when I got my first bass and went over to his house, I, had, I couldn't even tune it. And before he showed me how to tune it and showed me the names of the notes on the neck, he said, always remember the most important thing is the feel. 
So that was it. So Bob Essern is telling him, okay, let's do this or play eight bars there and then let's go. No, what, what I would say is, Glenn, do you want a blue light or, or a red light? And, and that's what worked with him. So there was, that was the major factor. And then also because uh, Alice was being pulled away and he would go into New York City and hobnob with celebrities while we're trying to write the album. You know, and then he got pulled more and more to doing interviews. And there was two reasons why we weren't doing interviews anymore. Number one, because Alice, uh, his uh, charming ability to make opening a tuna fish can into an ex interesting story, you know, uh, it was hard to do an interview with him because if he's telling somebody about the show last night now for me to add something to that I would I would tend to want to tell the truth as the other guys that's what we would remember about the show we would tell the truth and and that's like saying well what he just said isn't you know so it didn't it, it wasn't it, we would just sit there and be quiet because we didn't want to ruin a good story you know uh, but also, uh, at that point, they started deciding that it worked better as one guy. And we, we were uh, blamed for being lazy. Alice is getting up early and doing all the interviews while you guys, what do you mean we're, we're, we're writing the album while he's doing that? We're the ones that are doing the work. <laughs> so there was stuff like that where there was definitely difference of opinion. Uh, it was easier to control one person than it was to control the five of us because the five of us were opinionated and we would just make decisions together and then we would go in that direction. If we made a decision together and then somebody was pulling us in another direction, there was friction over that. It was our creative baby. You know, when, when Ezra first stepped into the picture, he was bringing out the best of what we wanted to do. And then it started turning into more of a Phil Spector thing where, where he would bring in somebody else to do this and somebody else to do that. And uh, all of a sudden, wait a minute, I like Glenn's guitar break on that. Why, are we, why do we have somebody else? You know, they're bringing in uh, Dick Wagner and, and Steve Hunter. They're amazing guitar players, but I liked what Glenn played on it. Why are, you, why are you replacing that? That's mm -hmm. an amazing guitar. And you know, I think uh, the Muscle of Love album suffered because of that. Uh, it didn't have Glenn. So Alice goes solo and he's like on the Hollywood squares and celebrity golf and like, so what's going on in your head? What, what are you, where are you guys at? I mean, I know you made the Billion Dollar uh, Babies record, but talk about like, I mean, that must have just been weird, right? Well, you've done your homework. You're asking, you're pushing my buttons with these questions. Huh? You know, uh, at one point, be, uh, or right around the time just before Love It to Death became big, uh, I had talked the band into not saying a word to the audience ever. We would, and the stage would go pitch black. And then on the last note of the song, and then on the first note of the next song, it, the lights would come on again. And we wouldn't say, hey, how you doing, Toledo? Because every other band did that. And it worked. We, we had this uh, intense uh, thing that, that really boosted the curiosity. Because people were coming to our shows, what's with you know, these guys, what's with the guy with the girl's name? What's with it? Well, we wouldn't give them the answers in the form of, oh, hey, yeah, I hope you like this song too, you know? So uh, it was working really well, and we weren't doing as many interviews either. Uh, but then with popularity and wanting to, to let the world know that we exist, all of a sudden that started going uh, breaking our image, and I thought the sailor suits broke our, shattered our image. I was against <laughs> that. We're not sailors. We're, we're this band that dresses crazy. We're not that, you know. So I was the one that really was kind of 
probably the spearhead of the one that was being disturbed by things like this. And as far as I'm concerned, Hollywood Squares was the end. That was the dirt on the grave for me, for, for our mystique. No, I'm sure. Um, we have to start wrapping up just because we're because of time, and I appreciate everyone for 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 uh, your time here. Um, They're the, all the, looking at their watches. <laughs> yeah, the relationship with with Alice is strange because you know, like, you know, you do the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame thing, and then he kind of goes off and does his thing, and I guess he doesn't want to be associated. He wants to be solo or whatever. But then again, you know, he. He is, he is a good guy in some ways in that he's like been married to the same woman and he's like been sober and kind of kept his path. So I don't know. I guess what do you think of Alice at this point, I guess is really the oh, question. Oh, we're still best friends. We've, you know, the, the group, uh, we're always best friends. Even during the worst of times, there was lots of humor. And, uh, you know, Alice and I are still best friends. We just always have been. Uh, no, he went, he went off the deep end, in the eight, and then yeah. he's still alive. That's mm -hmm. more the story. Mm -hmm. okay. And Cindy and I feel that uh, if the original band had been together, it wouldn't have gotten that drastic. But that's easier to say than it is to do, you know, with uh, somebody that has an addiction. Uh, but, uh, you know, Alice bounced back. It took him a couple of tries, but he bounced back and... Uh, uh, you know, he's, he's doing better than he was for a lot of years there. His voice is great. He's, uh, when he does uh, his touring, the young people in his band can't keep up with him. You know, he gets up, he plays golf, he, go, he goes shopping, he goes to a movie and does a, a show. And then all the interviews and meeting people in between, and then the next day does the same. Well, the band kind of takes turns, you know, they'll get up early and play golf and and hang out with Alice for a week, and then they go, oh, it's your turn, I can't keep up with him anymore. So it's all good in the end. Thank God he's, he lived through it, you know, and uh, there's a lot of uh, great musicians out there that didn't, you know, mm -hmm. and that's the uh, uh, tribute to all, all of his dead friends. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's all good, all mm -hmm. good. Alice has uh, always been a great friend to me. Awesome. Um, one last thing I wanted to kind of talk about was uh, you mentioned Cindy a few times. We'll pretend like she's not here, but um, you know Neil's sister. You know you're involved so much of the you know involved in the early band, the clothes, the getting you your original manager. Um, to me, this is the great this is the great rock and roll success story. It's like like enduring being through all of these things. These, this is well, you know, when I was young, when I was in grade school, a lot of kids didn't know my name. They called me the artist. I was just this quiet kid that did art. That's all I did. And when it came time to, I was second year in college, and when it came time for the band to move to L.A. and really start getting serious about the band, uh, I'm like, I can't choose music over art. And that's part of why we decided to incorporate art into it. And to me, that's, that's what it was. The visual parts was, we didn't even have to think about it. We worked very, very hard on our music. But as far as the, the theatrics and stuff, that was like, you know, that's a piece of cake. <laughs> that's amazing. So um, I think with Tony is, uh, Tony Mann here, I uh, have a few questions from the uh, crowd, uh, a few extra questions beyond what I did. Okay, I have a few more questions for Dennis, but uh, let's hear for Dennis and Steven. Okay. okay, all right, so, um, let's see here. Okay, this is a question from Dan Roselle. I don't know if he's there or not, Dan. Um, Advancing to the 21st century, you started playing with the Bouchard Brothers, a Blue Oyster Cult, in uh, Blue Coop. It's a very solid band. Talk about how that happened. Uh, 1972, we, the Alice Cooper group had become headliners, and we had uh, Dr. John as an opening act. And about the third show in, he started using a snake. We said, 
you can't use a snake. We use a snake in our show. <laughs> it's like, why I used a snake a long time before? Well, you weren't using a snake at the, so yeah. management told him, if you use a snake one more time, then we're going to get a replacement. Well, he used the snake, and we were at a festival in, in North Carolina, and, and Neil and Alice and I were walking around out in the crowd, and here comes this band on stage, you know, with this big giant backdrop with the symbol on it and everything. And I said, start play. They start playing. I go, that's who we should get. Yeah. And so uh, we did. They opened for us for uh, quite a few shows and we partied together a lot and be, we became friends. So uh, that's really the, the root of it. We mm -hmm. became friends uh, years ago. And then uh, over the years, every once in a while, we'd get together and jam, or I'd play on his demo at, home, at his home studio, and vice versa. Or we'd get together at parties and jam. And finally, uh, during the not the very last weekend of CBGBs, but the weekend before that, or maybe the weekend before that, but right toward the end there, a lot of musicians were playing at CBGBs. And at one point of this one night when I was there, it just happened to be me and Joe and Albert on stage, and this guy in the audience said, I want to hire you guys. I want to hire your band. We're like, what band? You know? and so, <laughs> so we did this gig that was three hours we played, with no rehearsal or anything. And we had so much fun, we said, well, maybe we should make this, uh, 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 you know, something more official. And we were thinking of what name. And jokingly, I said, Blue Oyster Cooper. You know, and then we decided to shorten it out. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, this is from uh, Rodney Klein. I know he's not here. He's in Los Angeles. Um, did you ever have a show, like somewhere, not at the beginning of your career, but when you guys were famous, where you didn't get paid? Chicago. Okay, <laughs> what happened? Well, the boys started flashing their guns. <laughs> and we're like, okay. <laughs> wow. Just yeah. Out of there. They were showing us their guns. And uh, not only did we have to play, because back then we would not set foot on stage until we got our money in our hand. Mm -hmm. We would be tuned up. And Chuck Berry. A lot of times, yeah. A lot of times uh, they wouldn't allow us to go on stage until the crowd started getting out of hand. And then finally they'd pay us and we'd play. But we would hardly ever start right when we were supposed to because of that. But in Chicago, they started flashing the guns, and we're like, we're playing. <laughs> not, not only that, but John, John Mayall followed us. And I'm thinking, now, is he going to wait for our show and then go on knowing he might not get paid? Or is he getting paid and we're not? I don't know. Wow, OK. That's pretty it, a lot of In the early days, we chased down a lot of promoters. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, this is from uh, Brian Matutin. He's not here. Um, are you related to Faye Dunaway? <laughs> not that I know of. Uh, <laughs> I will say though, I will say though, she does have a lot of the yeah. women in our our family. Get the features. Have the uh, cheekbones. Yeah. Yeah, the cheekbones are very done. And she's from Texas. There's a lot of Dunaways in Texas. Right. Okay. Um, from Howie Pyro, who is also not here. Uh, who is your favorite bass player? Oh my God. <laughs> I love so many bass players. It's unbelievable. I'll say Stanley Clark. Really? Stanley Clark. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, from Joseph Russo, not here. Um, did anyone in the band practice black magic? No. <laughs> no. Are you sure? I'm sure. Okay. He said. He said to say, "Are you sure?" He said. Oh. <laughs> uh, and this is from Randy Gregg. Uh, do you prefer? This is a bass geek question. Uh, flat wound or round wound strings? Well, I used uh, flat wound strings on most of the Alice Cooper albums up until the very first song I used round wounds was "Schools Out," mm -hmm. and the second song was "Blue Turk," and I use uh, round wounds a lot predominantly these days, but uh, I'm, I've been sort of going a little bit back to the flat wounds. It depends on the song. I mean, like, flat wounds are easier to do these slides. Like, I, I wrote the bass part for Billion Dollar Babies mm -hmm. on flat wounds specifically because of the slides, especially that very ending where I'm going, rear, 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 rear. Right. 
Right. Well, put some new roto sounds on and you're smelling burning flesh on that because <laughs> they're like a rat tail file. <laughs> I do it with round wounds, but they're, it, I'm much happier with flat wounds when I'm playing that part. All right, excellent. Let's hear That's it. That's it? Okay. Big thank you for Dennis Kelly. Thank you, Dennis.